Okay, um, and um, thank you for recording. Um, thank you for joining us. Please follow the ground rules for our virtual meeting. Everyone will be muted throughout the session, and we hope to have time after each speaker for a few questions. Use the chat feature to type your questions, and we will answer as many as we can. Sign language interpreters are provided at most meetings, including today's. If you need assistance accessing the interpreter, please put your request in the chat. Auto captioning is also provided. You may turn captioning on or off. Click the caret symbol next to the CC live transcript button if you wanna hide subtitles or go to view the full transcript. At the top of your video screen, you can choose between speaker view or gallery view, whichever you prefer. One last thing, sometimes we forget to put our mute buttons on. If that happens, I'll give a friendly reminder to um, mute your, your um, Zoom button. And the other thing too, I'll be giving all the speakers some reminders right before as their time is closing up so they can um, wrap up remarks. Thank you. Mary Neubauer. Yes, this is Mary Neubauer. Good afternoon. I'm a consultant for Mental Health America of Wisconsin and your co-chair of the Mental Health Task Force and representative on the Milwaukee County Mental Health Board. Meeting minutes, including speaker bios, are posted on our website and some materials may not be posted until after the meeting. Um, thank you for supporting uh, to our supporting members. Uh, remember, we have an online payment available via PayPal is now available. And the link is uh, in your materials and on our website. Please save the date for our 2022 meetings, the second Tuesday of the month from 3 to 5 p.m. Our January meeting will focus on housing resources and advocacy with speakers from the housing division and coordinated entry. Biographical information for our speakers is posted on the website for your reference. Thank you. Okay, without further ado, we're going to introduce our first speaker. Um, I saw that Sheriff Ernell R. Lucas is on our um, Zoom meeting and we're so happy that he's here. Um, we have asked the sheriff to speak about how the mental health needs and other healthcare needs of jail residents are being addressed and how the Milwaukee the Mental Health Task Force, family members, and advocates can assist with the community of care, as well as opportunities to work together to support voter registration and voting rights at the jail. Uh, note that we have shared some questions in advance that we have asked the sheriff to address. And um, please put your questions in the chat, but we'll, because of the time frame that we have, Sheriff, we'll be uh, giving special priority consideration for questions that address mental health related concerns as well as voting rights concerns. Without further ado, please welcome Sheriff Ernell R. Lucas. Thank you so much for coming to our task force meeting today. And I, I enjoyed meeting you at the SWIM meeting. The other, the other meeting. Uh, well, good afternoon. Can I be heard? Everyone can hear me, all right. Yep, you can. It, it, is, it is wonderful to be here. I'm disappointed, as uh, Christine just indicated, that this meeting um, is not in person because I know uh, that uh, many of us had hoped that we would be out of uh, the COVID at this point right now and that we could be back together again. But I did have the privilege of uh, meeting uh, Christine at uh, uh, an event of a couple of weeks ago. Um, Barbara, I know you're out there somewhere as well, and I... Uh, uh, it's been a long time um, uh, since we've seen each other. Patricia is there. I see uh, uh, on the call. Uh, um, Eugene, it's been a long time since I've seen you as well, my friend. Good to see you. Certainly, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Joseph L. Wanger. So many others um, who make up so much of what is the richness of Milwaukee. And so let me just thank all of you for inviting me here, for allowing me here. Um, I thought it appropriate that I still speak uh, from a, uh, an official position and a standing position in a podium uh, in as much as, again, I um, don't take this opportunity very lightly. Um, so uh, I'm going to open with a few uh, prepared remarks. Uh, some of it will touch on uh, the, some of the questions that were asked. And then I'm actually going to uh, save a few minutes to uh, specifically delve into one or two other points and then open it up to uh, questions. So that's uh, 
Okay, with uh, you, Christine, and the group, um, then I'll, I'll go right into my prepared remarks. Okay, without objection. Uh, any, any judges on the uh, call right now? Without objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, let me say that uh, good afternoon to all. I, I'm truly humbled uh, that this opportunity uh, presented itself. It's been a long time coming, um, but I certainly know of the outstanding work uh, that the Mental Health uh, Task Force Board uh, is doing here in our community. And it's really humbling for me as the sheriff uh, to be a part of this meeting. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak today because of the work that the organization, your organization is doing. Um, and it's the type of work that we need in our community uh, if we're going to change um, behaviors and certainly outcomes uh, of persons challenged by uh, mental health issues here in our community. Throughout my career in law enforcement, I have been I've seen a number of issues that uh, concern me and certainly how we as a profession have responded to the issue of mental health challenges is one that uh, we have not always done right and done best. Um, but it's because of the work and efforts of uh, groups like uh, the Mental Health Task Force that we're making progress and I, I'm, um, I see optimism uh, up ahead. Too often, as all of us are aware here today, uh, again, as I indicated, we've come short here in law enforcement. Um, but again, the work that you're doing, the work that Disability Rights Wisconsin, and having secured much needed change and work closely with uh, law enforcement agencies like ours and others in the area to educate and to enlighten our agencies on how we can truly become partners and not hindrances to reform. We have made it our mission here at the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office to treat everyone, everyone, every single member of our community with dignity and respect. That means that recognizing and respecting that many in our community experience mental illness, just like many in our community experience physical health challenges. And that in turn means changing how we operate as a law enforcement agency to ensure that we respond in an informed enlightened and compassionate manner when we act, uh, interact, I'm sorry, with individuals experiencing mental health challenges. We have taken it upon ourselves to transform the Milwaukee County Jail, certainly a source of disappointment and frustration in this county for a number of years prior to our administration uh, taking office a facility where two thirds of the people housed in our care receive some type of psychotropic medication. We have worked tirelessly with our uh, medical provider, WellPath, to ensure the highest possible standard of mental health care for persons in our care. And our healthcare team have proven their worth. Early this year, some of you may be aware, that the jail received accreditation by the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare for the first time in its history, marking a significant milestone in the reform of Milwaukee County Detention Services. More recently, our chief physician at the jail was awarded the Provider of the Year by WellPath's nationwide headquarters, reflecting the exceptional standard of care that we provide in our facility. And some of you may not be aware, but the consent decree that Milwaukee County has been under now since uh, 1999, when the uh, federal monitor was here in July, he indicated that his last visit to Milwaukee may have been that visit by virtue of the fact that he has every bit of confidence and trust and the people in the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office to provide the level of health care and service to persons housed in our custody. That is truly an accomplishment for the Milwaukee County and for the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office that has uh, benefits beyond uh, just simply getting beyond the consent decree. Recognizing that mental health and substance abuse challenges sometimes accompany one another, we have worked with our partners at WellPath to provide innovative services for persons in our care requiring substance abuse treatment. 
Recently, we initiated a pilot medication assisted treatment program, often referred to as MAP, that allows individuals to receive medications like Vivitrol, Suboxone, and even more recently, methadone under the oversight of a trained physician. We have also worked to expand access to competency restoration services within the Milwaukee County Jail so that persons in our care who are found not competent to stand trial can avoid a transfer to out of county facilities like Mendota or Winnebago. Instead, this, when this program has been fully developed, we will be able to provide highly advanced mental health treatment and evaluation here in our jail facility, allowing program participants to remain closely connected to their families and local support systems, so much so badly needed uh, in, in our treatment and care of those persons uh, with mental health uh, issues. But we can only do so much within the criminal justice system. In order to help our fellow community members receive the services they need when they interact with the criminal justice system, we need to find alternatives to pretrial detention for persons arrested on low level, nonviolent charges. The Sheriff's Office works with our Community Justice Council, Public Defender's Office, and the District Attorney's Office to identify persons in our care on low level offenses who are well suited for these alternatives. And we did this at a time that we all recognize uh, during the time of COVID. And while jail populations have risen and recently, we continue to support the evidence-based practices through our newly initiated jail population analysis program. As part of this program, we brought in a grant funded analyst who scrutinizes the demographics of our jail population to include mental health needs and services to help us develop and prepare policies that meet the health and safety needs of everyone in our care. Outside the jail, we have moved the sheriff's office forward in our approach to subjects experiencing a mental health crisis. We began these efforts by expanding access to crisis intervention training within our agency. While a significant percentage of our employees had received this training about 10 years ago, most of our newer hires had not received this type of training. From 2019, when our administration came in to the present, we have connected deputies with correctional officers with multiple opportunities to attend crisis intervention training. We also began the process of establishing a crisis assessment and response team, otherwise known as CARP, in collaboration with you, the Behavioral Health uh, Division, and others. Earlier this year, the Mental Health Board, as you know, and the County Board authorized the creation and funding of three deputy sheriff's positions tied to the CART unit. One of these deputies is currently out in the field right now, partnering with a behavioral health clinician to help de-escalate public safety emergencies involving individuals experiencing a psychiatric crisis. The remaining two deputies have been receiving intensive field training and will deploy independently starting on January 1. The Sheriff's Office CART unit has significantly expanded the scope of Milwaukee County CART resources as they respond not only within our core jurisdiction, but within the 17 municipalities in Milwaukee County that do not have a CART program within their police department. This includes every municipality except Milwaukee and West Dallas, who both uh, operate their own CARP program. Due to the work of our deputies and their partners at the Behavioral Health Division, every square inch of Milwaukee County will now receive coverage from a CARP program. Ultimately, all of these efforts taken together reflect the same commitment 
to ensure that every resident of our community, no matter their unique health needs, receives dignified, humane, and just treatment from their sheriff's office. I encourage anyone in the audience today who would like to learn more about our office, our mental health programming, and opportunities for direct engagement to contact our office here at the Milwaukee County Sheriff. I am um, delighted to have this opportunity to speak uh, before you. And let me say before I, I go to questions um, that um, there were a number of issues that uh, were brought to my attention, uh, questions that I do want to uh, uh, discuss um, and talk about. And it, it talks about training. And one of the things that we have done here in the sheriff's office since we came into office in 2019 is at 16 hours of training um, at our training academy for all of our, um, all of our deputies in uh, uh, crisis intervention. Uh, we feel it's important that all of our members, uh, not those who are just simply assigned to the CART team, but that all of our members receive this type of training so that they can identify and recognize uh, uh, issues uh, in our community. Um, we are hopeful uh, with the, and the enlightenment on the part of the county board and the county executive's office that we can can expand uh, the CART team in 2022, that we can participate in other uh, programs that have been come to our attention, like uh, the ICAT program um, that was started by uh, the Police Executive Research uh, Forum. And it helps uh, officers in their response to uh, nonviolent uh, situations involving persons uh, with mental health uh, issues so that we will uh, uh, and give the appropriate response to the situation, de-escalate and allow for an alternative to either A, incarceration and or B, institutionalization. Certainly, as I mentioned, the CAR team, uh, we're very appreciative and very grateful uh, that uh, we finally got that underway here in 2021. Um, I was hopeful for a much more expanded uh, CART team. Um, we initially had proposed uh, five members, and certainly the county board saw fit to uh, fund uh, three positions, but we're grateful and we're hopeful and we're optimistic that we'll, the, the CART team will prove its worth and prove its uh, value here in Milwaukee County such that the county board will have no um, alternative but to uh, further fund uh, the uh, CART team in 2022. Some of the things that uh, we've done in partnership with uh, the community, um, we've asked and we've invited in groups uh, to participate in voting rights um, efforts here in uh, our jail. Um, we've partnered with groups that have been able to uh, collect uh, absentee ballots uh, for those persons who are in our custody and our care here in a Milwaukee uh, County Jail to ensure that those persons' rights um, uh, to vote are not infringed upon simply because they are being housed in our facility at the time of election. I think that that's quite uh, an accomplishment and a testament to the people that we are here in the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office and the work that we're proud to do in conjunction with all of you in our, in our community. Uh, some of the um, things that uh, we can hope for in terms of our continued relationship with the Mental Health Task Force, and with the Behavioral Health Division and all of our partners here in Milwaukee County is that you can commit, continue to communicate with us. Um, we're only as good as the information that's made available to us. And oftentimes when we do not get the full picture or we're not hearing from every side, some uh, can be um, disappointed if not um, unaware of the efforts that we're making, the progress that we're making here at the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office but let me say that uh, by communicating with us, uh, whether it's through the Criminal Justice uh, uh, Council here, the CJC, or uh, again, at your mental health uh, task force uh, board meetings and through other vehicles, we all can continue to grow and learn and respond better uh, to the mental health issues here in our community. Let me say lastly, um, it is important for us 
as an agency to ensure that those individuals that are in our care still have that personal relationship with family, friends, and loved ones here in our community, such that, that uh, despite COVID and despite the challenges uh, that we've faced for over the now the last 20 months or so, that providing that, 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 that closeness, that contact, that interaction of family and loved ones to those persons housed in our care can only help when they return to the community and, 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 and help them in their recovery. And so we're uh, committed to uh, continue to provide that access and that uh, ability for people in this community to reach out to their loved ones in our care so that we can continue to have that uh, continuum of care here in Milwaukee County. Let me say, as the sheriff of Milwaukee County now for almost three years, it truly has been um, the highlight of my professional career that the work that we've been able to do over the course of the last three years in terms of restoring the honor, integrity, and trust back to this organization by partnering with uh, organizations like uh, the Behavioral Health Division here at Milwaukee County and the uh, Mental Health Task Force, partnering with all of our law enforcement agencies, and more importantly, partnering with the people of our community, that is a testament to the men and women who comprise the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. I am so humbled and so honored to be the sheriff of this agency, and I want to thank all of you for your continued support and your continued efforts to help us change the lives of people suffering from mental health issues here in in our community. So with that, I want to say thank you all and um, um, wish you all the very best and may God bless you all. Thank you, thank you very much, Sheriff. Um, one comment, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and I will field some of them. I just want to thank you for um, talking with us today and for your use of per first person language for people who are housed in your facilities. Uh, that's really refreshing to hear. Um, I will ask the first uh, question that I saw. Um, it's from Denise Johnson. Um, uh, sorry. Do you still get training on how to work with people who are deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing? We have had um, some challenges continuing that effort here in Milwaukee County, um, but it still is ongoing. Um, but again, because of um, uh, interpreters, um, uh, certainly those that uh, we have uh, barriers because of languages here in, in, in uh, Milwaukee County, as well as the ability to um, 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 work with those persons that are, are challenged um, visually and or uh, hearing impaired. Um, but it's an effort that has continued ongoing here in Milwaukee County. It's, it still is a, a service available, but it's been made more challenging here of recent, uh, but we continue to move forward. Okay, the next one that I can see um, here, Sheriff Lucas, I'm wondering if you could describe in more detail the process, uh, processes and partners that are part of access to voting for eligible residents of the jail and House of Correction. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, certainly, um, um, I was asked by a number of um, uh, members of this community um, to allow for uh, absentee ballots uh, to be uh, taken here in Milwaukee County. Uh, just by name, I don't know if she's on the call, but uh, Jewel Lily Kohler is one who certainly has reached out to me on a number of occasions. I worked with her, her daughter, uh, and others. And forgive me, as the sheriff of the agency, I'm not involved in the intimate uh, working relationships in the jail and in those efforts. But again, it was the outreach of, of concerned uh, citizens like um, Jewel Lily and others who pressed me and pressed our agency uh, to adhere to the high standards that we set for ourselves. And again, ensuring the rights of those individuals that are in our care uh, during the period of a uh, voting cycle. And so again, uh, we're, we will open um, our doors to any and all who wish to work and partner with us uh, during the election season. And again, if our rep track record hasn't proven it, then please tell me where we've fallen short and we'll make sure that we uh, pick up those efforts. Uh, related question from Barbara Beckert. 
Thanks for your support of voting rights, Sheriff. Will you commit to allowing community volunteers to come in and assist with voter registration? Uh, thank you, Barbara, for your question. I heard a few words that right now give me pause, if for no other reason because of COVID. Come in, don't know, but can we continue to have the, the, the conversation, the dialogue, and the efforts of ensuring the rights of those persons that are housed in our care during a voting cycle? The answer is uh, yes, we will continue to partner with uh, you, Barbara, and anyone else. Um, but again, uh, because of COVID, our, our ability to have persons enter in our facility has um, certainly been um, um, put off for now over the course of the last 20 months, but the partnership still remains. Thank you, a comment and a question from Mike Lappin. Um, BHD is very excited about our CARP partnership. Uh, Sheriff Lucas, thank you for your leadership and collaboration to make this happen. Uh, we all thank you for that, um, both of you. Uh, from Mike Selkup to, to Sheriff. Sheriff Lucas, could you talk a little bit more about competency restoration at, sorry, uh, the jail instead of Mendota and who provides these services? It was a partnership that uh, that was, we were approached as an alternative to, uh, we were having challenges with uh, the, when Mendota and some of the other uh, Winnebago uh, being um, um, no beds available. And so as a result, uh, we partnered with the Department of Corrections and others um, that we can, and we got the, um, the permission and the go ahead from the Department of Corrections that uh, instead of transferring those individuals, even despite them being directed and ordered by a judge to go uh, to Mendota, to receive that treatment and care here in Milwaukee County. And thus far, uh, thus far, we're very pleased with the results. It um, obviously uh, cuts down on our ability to have to transport an individual um, outside of our facility. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity um, because of some of the backlog, because beds were not available, uh, in Mendota, it gives us it gives us the opportunity to begin care and treatment um, um, promptly here in the Milwaukee County Jail, and not have to wait for that individual to receive that treatment um, uh, once they reside at an, another uh, facility. So, I think it's been a very productive partnership. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will uh, continue even beyond COVID. Uh, that it will continue. And it's one that has bare uh, uh, benefits and results for all here in Milwaukee County. Gosh, yes. Um, the next question is from Eugene and Tosa. When there are, are an obvious dual physical and behavioral um, health issues, who is making the choice where to get help? Is Granite Hill staffed with at least a physician's assistant? And is this a question for the sheriff or Mike Lappin or both? I'm not sure. I can't speak to, uh, thank you, Jean, for the question. Um, I was at the opening at uh, Granite Hills uh, a few, a month or so ago now, um, and just exactly how that partnership and relationship all is gonna work out yet um, hasn't um, uh, fully um, been fleshed out. Um, but again, I got an opportunity to tour the facility to meet um, the administrators at uh, Granite Hills and I'm confident that all the needs that we have here in Milwaukee County uh, can and will be met by the partnerships that we've uh, established, certainly uh, Mike and um, Behavioral Health and others, that I'm confident that the uh, working relationship that we'll have with Granite uh, Hills would be one that will continue to provide a high level of continuity of care for those persons uh, challenged by mental health issues here in Milwaukee County. Um, a comment and a question, Sheriff, a uh, comment for me, uh, you know, jails were never meant to be behavioral health facilities for treatment. So we're sorry that you were put in this position. I understand it as a person who's worked in a prison for 20 years. Um, but the question is um, for Barbara Beckert, how can family members and advocates, case managers interact with jail staff and assist with information, continuity of care? And can the website include a community slash family liaison? Well, thank you again, uh, uh, Barbara, for the question. Um, it, again, um, we, it, we think it's, it's, it's important that that uh, contact with family members and loved ones uh, is maintained uh, while an individual is here um, in our care. 
And thus, uh, we think it's important for all of us to continue to engage. Certainly, um, uh, the jail staff is readily available. Uh, Barbara, if it's not uh, known to you who the jail commanders are and who the persons to reach uh, there, I can provide it uh, following this meeting so that you can have that those direct lines of communication. Certainly, uh, the CJC, which we know has gone virtual for the past 20 months, like a lot of other meetings, like this meeting as well, uh, is a vehicle and an avenue by which to uh, reach out to us. If I'm not in attendance, certainly a member of my staff is always in attendance um, to convey concerns or issues as it relates to continuity of care. Uh, but most importantly, uh, again, the website um, um, is certainly a, a vehicle by which we can use as well. Um, but um, Barbara, I would encourage uh, if there um, is needs or there are issues um, that need to be addressed. Um, for me, um, as someone who has been in, in um, law enforcement and public safety now for over four decades, I find that that personal interaction, that one-to-one -one contact, is much more helpful, much more beneficial uh, than some other means. So again, uh, following this uh, call, I, I will be glad to uh, provide our information to, to you to reach out uh, to members of uh, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Lucas, this is Barbara. First of all, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think for us at Disability Rights Wisconsin, because we're a legal service agency, I don't know that we've experienced barriers to reaching contacts at the sheriff's office when we've had to, so I didn't mean to give that impression. I think our concern is that for family members who have a loved one at the jail, as well as for case managers who may be knowledgeable about the mental health needs, we wanted to offer the suggestion that having a community or family liaison and having that information on the website, that that could really be a productive thing. I think it could help your staff because they would have the ability to have that connection with someone who is committed to the well being of that person and to continuity of care. And I think for the family members, you know, sometimes in the past they've had to, you know, with the consent degree in place, they went through legal aid or ACLU and they went to them with their questions. Well, that's not gonna be in place in the near future, as you mentioned. So this would be a great transition plan if you would establish that kind of a liaison. So we hope you'll consider that. That's a wonderful recommendation. And I will uh, go back to my staff and, um, and, and explore that possibility. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, last question on the table from Reverend Elwanger. What chaplaincy services are available at County Jail and HOC? Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Joe. Um, we've uh, been very uh, uh, intentional in the expansion of our chaplain uh, program here at the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. You know, I was just reading an, an article uh, yesterday in the New York Times about during these times of COVID that um, so many uh, people are um, challenged by COVID with anxieties and, 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 and certainly depression. And not only just those persons that are uh, housed or in our care, um, but even our members um, are, are challenged by uh, the times that we've been going through. And so we've uh, been very intentional in terms of expanding our chaplaincy services uh, and added a, a, a number of names um, um, to our list of chaplains. And we make it available to those persons uh, uh, that are in our care, as well as to our members. Uh, certainly, Reverend Joe, uh, someone of your uh, years of uh, wisdom and experience, um, if there's an opportunity or an avenue by which you wish to serve uh, on the uh, uh, chaplaincy board here at the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, this sheriff, and I know our agency would welcome that. And certainly, um, as one who um, has um, a long uh, tie and commitment to this community and understand the importance uh, of a faith-based approach um, to issues here in Milwaukee County, it's important that we have those services readily available. So uh, this agency is committed to it. I'm personally committed to it. And we certainly will welcome any support that you can uh, provide us. Um, sorry, Sheriff. There's one last question I lied. Um, how is the jail working with a transition from jail back into the neighborhood, working with Justice Point and peer support? We've had a, uh, a very productive uh, relationship uh, with uh, Justice Point, and certainly uh, some of the efforts um, here in the jail may not be as robust as some of the efforts at the Milwaukee County um, 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 House of Correction, 
uh, in terms of um, um, the programs uh, for reintegration back into uh, the community. Uh, but that nonetheless doesn't mean that we're not uh, still working uh, to try to expand those programs here in the uh, Milwaukee County Jail. Um, again, COVID has been, it's really been a challenge for us in terms of uh, those persons that we've housed um, over the course of um, the last uh, 20 months. Um, we saw our numbers um, uh, dip to uh, around the 500 mark um, in uh, 2020 and throughout 2020. But unfortunately, uh, we've seen an increase in those numbers arising here in 2021 uh, to the extent, and as a result, and let's not uh, sugarcoat anything, all of you see and read the news that we've had a shortage here of um, officers working in our jail facility. And so as a result, our ability uh, to deliver services have been challenged by um, those issues with uh, staffing here in the Milwaukee County Jail, as it is in, in a number of employers throughout uh, um, the county and for that matter, throughout the country. But again, our commitment is to um, partnering and working with Justice Point and others um, to help and um, the, uh, reduce the rate of recidivism and those persons coming into our custody and our care so that when they go back out into the community that they have the tools, that they have the resources that they need um, to uh, move forward in life and not have to uh, return to our care and our custody. Thank you so much, uh, Sheriff. We really appreciate the time you took to come to our meeting and talk all about your wellness and health programs. And just know that you will provide you with all the partner agencies on this Zoom call today because we're here to assist in any way that we can. We know that um, safety and security involves a great wellness program and we're here to help any way we can. Well, thank you. Uh, and let me wish everyone a, a safe, a peaceful and joyous holiday season. H happy holidays, Merry Christmas to everyone. And thank you all for all your work in 2021. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God bless. Thank you. God bless you. All right, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, before I do, I'd like to say that one of the most underserved populations in the area of mental health uh, in Milwaukee and Wisconsin and across uh, the Midwest this is the Latinx community. And um, our next speaker is going to address that. And uh, I read through the materials and it's, I'm very excited that we're able to uh, have Paula, um, Anna Paula Soares to speak with us today. And um, she comes with a very diverse background as a uh, bilingual licensed professional counselor and the director of the program. Um, she does some very unique things as a, a somatic therapist. She does breath work, she does dance work, uh, dance and some very um, amazing things that are not traditional therapeutic practices. And uh, uh, welcome Anna to the uh, Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I want to um, thank to Martina Golan for the uh, Mental Health of America that connected us here. Thank you, Barbara, for all the back and forth to make sure that all the information was in the right places. Um, I want to say that I'm going to share a lot of information. Uh, don't worry about having to write it down because sounds like a lot of the information I'm going to share in terms of links and opportunities, it's all also at the, um, at the website, which is connected to the agenda. So that was great. Very well, well organized in this way, because otherwise it's all, all over the place. So I wanted to share, um, I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, this is going to help me to keep myself in track to the ones that know me knows that I like to talk <laughs> and share. Um, so I want to just keep myself in track here because we have around 15 minutes. So this, um, like Mary sh sharing, um, we this is not new to our Latinx community. Mental health, uh, emotional health is something that is um, it, it, it's hard for our community to have access uh, to health insurance, generally speaking, it's hard to have access to mental health services, especially 
culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate. Um, so it's not it's nothing new for our community. However, the pandemic was hit the community really hard because a lot of the people were first was um, were community members that were working throughout the pandemic because there were there were people working in in uh essential essential workers so a lot it was a high level of of people that got sick lost loved ones lost jobs so of course if a community is already facing a lot of um obstacles uh, when the pandemic hits it hits hard um so this or this uh, bilingual mental health campaign is very grassroots we started very small is growing and we have a lot of support but it's very grassroots still and it, we say bilingual because we have all our digital materials with with sub subtitles in English. However, the focus is really the Spanish speaking community. So all our videos and digital materials are all in Spanish with subtitles in English. Um, so the next one, please. I think Barbara's helping me to move. So the campaign objective is to increase awareness regarding mental health crisis uh, that we're facing in the like next community. Um, like I mentioned right now, it's nothing new, but there's not a, much awareness about it outside of the community, even within the community. A lot of our community members don't have a lot of psychoeducation around emotional health and mental health. So a lot of people are experiencing things they, they are not related to stress or trauma or other experiences they're having. So this is really uh, to bring awareness inside the community and outside of the community. Increase access to culturally and linguistically appropriate psychoeducational digital materials. Uh, we know we're not solving the problem, right? Uh, this problem is very systemic. We're talking about po politics, immigration. We're talking about access to mental, uh, access to healthcare. So it's a huge issue. We're not trying to solve it, but we really wanted to increase access to education so people at least know what's going on or they are starting to talk about it. As many people talk about it, more we potentially have policies that are being talked about it too. Um, decrease stigma, like I mentioned, you know, within the community itself, sometimes, uh, most of the time, people are not talking about it. Uh, provide mental and emotional support through virtual group sessions. So in addition to developing mater digital materials in Spanish with local people, uh, we're also hosting groups in the community to promote the material and go deeper into supporting what they need. The next one. Um, so the, this campaign, like I said, started very, very grassroots. It was one day that in, like some leaders in the Latino community informally were talking about what's going on. And then we had this idea of potentially doing a campaign. And everybody looked at me because of my background in mental health. And when I see I'm completely involved in this. Um, so we wrote a, a grant, literally was the next day was the due date. And I was, I don't know if you guys relate to this, right? That happens. And then I wrote the grant and we got the grant and I was very, very happy. And, and um, so it was a grant from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And very quickly, I realized that I needed a lot more money to be able to develop a really robust campaign the way we were envisioning, right? So the seed money came from the health department um and then we we just were like okay let's let's use the seed money to really kick something and get more people involved and do more partnerships and then Centro Spano in Madison were uh, got very excited and they, they became our, our fiscal agent. So they are a house there, but it's a very independent um, campaign in, and they have a lot of, they're supporting us a lot. We were able to fundraise $100,000 in three months, which was a great success. Um, and we're still, we're still looking for more um, financial support to continue doing the services. But with this, we were able to act, to develop the actual material that we wanted to do. So the next one. So we got support from Aurora, Rogers, uh, Brother, um, Broader Impact, Corker Foundation, Planned Parenthood, Colby Foundation, the WPHA, Bader, and the, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Those are our main funders. We have some partnership, informal partnerships where people are promoting and they're, we have a, a long list I'm going to share with you of people that are actually helping us to um, carry on the campaign. But those are the, the organizations that help us to develop the actual campaign. So then I want to share a little bit of our, our campaign team. 
Uh, so we are for the main strong team. I call the dream team because they're amazing to work with, super talented women in the community. Uh, I'm uh, developing, coordinating, and directing, but Maria Salcido is a psychotherapist. And she is helping with the content, like together me, me and her the, design the content for it. And then Angeles Rodriguez is a very well-known and very capable promotora de salud community health worker in the community for the last 16 years. She's also helping to develop content and also recorded a video. And Sandra Dempsey with Sourstein is our producer. So she helped to develop everything and, and, and direct the art part. So it was very fun to learn how to put a content of like 20 minutes into three minutes, right? So um, Maria Salcida and I came, okay, we need to teach this, we need to teach this, and this is important. And she's like, great, but then how do you put this in three minutes? So we had to learn how to do a lot of things like the scripts. And so it was a great experience. Um, the content of it was chosen to be very specific of like very uh, tips, tips and very practical things that people could do. Uh, so we have one in how to calm emotional, you know, when you're feeling very emotional or stress through breathing and through other somatic things. Mary mentioned that I have psychosomatic background. So we're using a lot of like very specific tips that people can calm down so they can actually deal with some situations they're going through. We're talking about relationships in the family, how to better communicate within the families because a lot of people are quarantined. And, um, and so we have four videos. Thank you for, for shifting. And then we're also talking about uh, uh, teenagers. How, how can we help teenagers to get out of their technology and support them to be more connected to the family? So we have four videos so far. And then let me, uh, the next one, please. So then we decided that um, we wanted to really bring it up. That, so we had the videos ready and we said, you know what? Let's go for something bigger. So we connected with Telemundo, Wisconsin, which is one of the main um, Hispanic channels, the TV channels here. And we connected with them saying, hey, listen, we're having all these issues in the community. We have those videos ready. Would you be able to promote them and they're very excited to actually help us so we have a partnership with Telemundo Wisconsin and we develop a three minute no 30 minute tv show with the videos in it and then and then there's some interviews with me where I can add additional information so it's very packed but there's a lot of information um, so then we did the 30 minute tv show we were able to present it at Telemundo for a month every week uh, the show in different times so we can reach different people and then we did a couple of interviews to promote also how to how to speak about mental health how to reach services and why is it important to um, talk about mental health and so we had interviews at PBS and also at Telemundo and then the next one please we also had a billboard um, at uh, National and Greenfield, right in the, in the heart of the, the Southside community. And the idea was two things. We wanted to promote um, the website because within the website is where we have all the videos, all the content. But we also wanted to just plant the seed. Hey, mental health, emotional health exists, is there. Let's talk about it. So we wanted to kind of bring it to the streets those those conversations um and also we this this printable card here is in the website close to in the agenda for today um we what some organizations are doing is that they are printing this if they have money colorful if they don't black and white <laughs> and they're printing this and sharing with their clients you know so coral central is doing it and some other places where here's oh here if you want to tips about mental health go to this website so people are sharing to the community that way 101 is when people trust mostly so hopefully they had seen on tv and then they can get this from practitioners so you if you feel called to do it you can you can print and you can promote anyway this campaign is really it's really to reach families like you know so as much as you want to and feel called to promote better um, the next one. So here's the website um, for you to go into it. We have three layers to the website. The first one is talking about who we are. It's all in Spanish because we're really reaching that community. The second page, if you go on top, 
it says videos. You can find everything in one page, all the videos if you want to check it out, the videos and watch the videos. And then the third one is sponsorship. So we're still looking for partnerships to broader, you know, the promotion and potentially go national um, and be able to do more groups in the community. The groups are all in Spanish so far, because like I said, it's focused on the Spanish speaking community. Um, and the next one, please. And this is the, the, the people that are mostly now in, engaged in promoting this. So um and, but the list continues to grow thank god and and once again i want to thank uh, martina for connecting me with with you all and the next one so we don't have time today because you know we only have 15 minutes um to show the videos and go a little deep into the content of the video but i would say please contact me the information is in the website and agenda if you have any questions, if you have any ideas, concerns, uh, once you go to the content of the video. Um, and in terms of engagement or for you to be involved, like I mentioned, if there is any uh, interest of partnerships, it, we're open to that because we still want to promote. Spread the word if you can. You can post those in your website. And if you're interested, let's say your organization doesn't have like you know, a, a big partnership funding. If you're interested, like, oh, we have like a, you know, parents support group. We have groups that are already coming together, teenager groups. Um, we are doing, we're coming in some of those groups already. They're already there and presenting the, the materials and talking about mental health. So Maria Salcido, the therapeutic groups and, and Angeles, because she's a health promoter, she does peer support groups and she does psychoeducational groups in the community. So some organizations don't have huge funding, but they could host one or two groups, you know, um, and share the principal materials, the, the principal cards if you want. So this is how can you get engaged of course, I had to explain it really quick because we don't have much time. But if you have any questions, you can connect with me directly. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I can see, you know, based on looking in, in, here in the group that you guys are um, doing a lot of work in the community. There's a lot of agencies here engaged. I'm very thankful to be here. And it sounds like the work is just beginning because we still have a lot of need in the community. So I want to thank Barbara again for all the, the work and making sure all is organized and all the information is in the website. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I saw one question in the chat, by the way, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'm going to get right to the question, and we want to have you back at this meeting, so I'm hoping that you will agree to come back so we can see the videos. Um, thank you. Is your, this is from Denise Johnson, is your caption in Spanish as well? What do you mean? Can you expand on your question? Well, I'm asking if your captioning is only in English or if it's also in Spanish, because I'm thinking of um, deaf Spanish speakers. So uh, do you have yes. that? Yes, I hear you. You, I hear you think you're thinking right. This is a good question. That uh -huh. so I don't. We don't at this point. We don't at this point, but this is a great question and we need to see how can we expand that because at this point we have, you know, with our, um, uh, with our producer, we have all the materials and we have access to people that, that can add subtitles. So there's definitely a potential for that. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. Any other questions in the chat? Um, this is Barbara. I have a question. I didn't get a chance to put it in the chat. I apologize, but thank you so much, Anna. I just wondered, um, because the work you're doing is so important, if there are any opportunities with the ARPA funding, because Milwaukee County has a task force right now, and they're looking at getting community input on how to use those funds. And your project is such an important one to sustain and, you know, it is related to COVID in terms of the increased mental health need. That's a really good question. I did participate in some conversations statewide. 
um, about about funding for COVID re recovery. And um, in Milwaukee, I had David Fraser um, for uh, connected with me from Aurora. And he mentioned that to me, but I never, he never followed up. And I was kind of waiting to see where it was. At. So if you Rick, have some contact. Yeah. Rick, yes. Ricardo Diaz is the oh. chair for that kind for that group. And I don't know if you know Ricardo, but I'd be happy. From United, to, from United Community Center? For, yeah, for, yes. yeah, the past director from UCC. And yes. so, you know, certainly someone who's so, uh, I'm sure sensitive to the needs in your community. So I, I think it could be a great opportunity. And um, if I can dig up some information, I'll, I will send it your way. But otherwise, you know, you might just want to reach out to him directly and ask what the protocol is and the way to provide information about this really important project. Thank you so much. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And one last question. Um, what is the best way to connect with you and your team, Anna Paula? So you can at this point, uh, if you if you wanna if you have information if you if you want more information if you if, if it's a deeper bigger partnership you can connect with me. I'm gonna put my email here. Uh, it's already in there, but I'm just gonna put it here anyway. Um, you can connect directly with me for partnerships and bigger questions. If you're interested in hosting one group or hosting a series of therapeutic groups, you can also connect directly with our, our psychotherapist, Maria Salcido, or the community health promoter, which is already in the list. So if, you're, if you wanna just host groups, you can call directly to them. But if it's bigger conversations of partnerships, you can connect with me. Uh, is asking, can we share the videos with our network? Please do, please do, please do. Because the videos are done already. We have the subtitles in English. We don't have the subtitles in Spanish. We need to work on that. Um, but really, it's, it, is, it is to promote as, as much as we can. The video, because it's developed through foundations and through this, the health department money, um, is really free to be to be getting to people's houses and people's devices. They're on the phone all the time. They might as well like get some good information, hopefully. So please do. You can share in your website. You can share with clients. You can share with small groups. They're already doing things. Um, any way that you can think create creatively. Uh, one ask I have is that we we do. I'm gonna send a. I'm gonna put a link or maybe send it out a link to Barbara and maybe she can add that other link. We're doing a Facebook too. I forgot about this. We're doing a Facebook and sometimes Facebook doesn't like when when you when you leave Facebook to send it to YouTube, for example. So in order to go farther away, you if you're gonna post on Facebook, you can post from our post. And that's going to reach more people. That's how Facebook works. So I'm also going to send out the link to our Facebook campaign. And then you can, if you can promote from there, it's going to go farther. They, they have a tendency to show more people. Um, so that's one ask. But you can share any way you want, um, any way you get creative to do that. Miriam, uh, do you want me to? That's okay. I While she's looking, I'll say thank you so much. Um, we do want to, I agree with Martina, please share with your networks all the links you had shared with us and, and ways to partner with you. We need, this is a resource that is hugely, as you know, needed in our, our community. And so thank you for taking the time out. We hope that we can see you again and share yes. in our networks. Thank you so much. And it's fun because it's local, it's developed locally with leaders from the community. The actors are all members of the community, um, community health workers and members of the community. So very local resource. And um, and thank you. Thank you for having me here. Any, any uh, questions you can connect with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. Yes, Christine, you have number four. Thanks. Um, now, you know, it's been a rough couple of years for all of us around the world. So what, what an embarrassment of riches today. We have Tim Grove, senior consultant at St. A's. He's going to be talking about the traumatic impacts of the pandemic. It's just what the doctor ordered. Um, Tim Grove, are you here? I am here, Christine. Can you hear me? I can. Can others? 
Awesome. And the audio is coming through okay? Absolutely. Great. It's good to see all of you. There are some familiar faces, which is always good to see. And it's good to get to know some of others, you who we haven't had the chance to meet. So Christine said it well, I have a, a, an unenviable task <laughs> of trying to unpack just maybe how difficult the past couple of years have been, and probably more importantly, what it portends for all of us moving forward. And let me just give you the crib notes conclusion uh, before I pull up my slides and dig into the material. There's this beautiful scene in the old movie Jaws that some of you might remember seeing when they first are out on their little boat and they encounter this big, huge shark. And one of the actors in the movie says to the other one after stepping back from seeing the size of the shark, gulping a little bit and basically says, we're gonna need a bigger boat. So uh, at risk of being a little too cliche or glib, that is the synopsis of what I'm about to share with you. The silver lining I would argue in that potential conclusion is that if we know that, maybe we can actually build a bigger boat and maybe we can stem some of what many experts think are coming. So with that as something of an introduction, uh, whoops, Barbara or Christine, can you uh, enable me as a co-host? Absolutely, I'm on it. Awesome. You've got it. Perfect. There we go, thank you. So I hope you don't mind if I move through this somewhat quickly. I know many of you are well-versed in this conversation already. So I was hoping to just kind of organize it in a way that could provide some value or use to all of you. So we will get started. Uh, one of the things we've tried to do from a trauma point of view, a mental health point of view, is establish a bit of a baseline. So it's really popular to talk about the last couple of years and the potential effect they might have on our mental health collectively and individually. There may be some value in just going back to sort of pre-pandemic times and remembering or rethinking, and there are people on this call who are probably better versed at this than I am. What did we know about mental health in America pre-pandemic times? And let me just get this box out of the way for you all quickly. There you go. So I tried to collect, and Martina and others uh, have much more sort of detail on this. My synopsis is the status of mental health in America was in somewhat dire straits before pandemic times. Here, just some data points for you all to think about and consider, probably reinforcing what you already felt or knew. One of the siren calls that many people paid attention to was the CDC talking to us about life expectancy declining. If I recall, two or three years in a row. And the CDC, this is Dr. Redfield uh, offering perspective, thinking about sort of some of the tragedies driving those outcomes. And he issued words like, let's please make this a wake up call, uh, recognizing that a lot of this can be preventable. Here is some data that some of you might have seen on sort of teenagers and depression. Again, all pre pandemic times. So looking at rates of depression characterized by a major depressive episode at 7.9% in 06, 
14.4% in 2018. And from my point of view, we often try to think about how we can start to try to consider how trauma plays a role in mental health presentation. It's a very fascinating discussion to have. One of the nation's experts unpacked it this way in Dr. Sharfstein's favorite quote that says, trauma is mental health is smoking is to cancer. Another way to think about that is from the ACE interface material. So this is data from the state of Washington using epidemiological measures to say what percentage of these mental health sort of outcomes are directly attributed to trauma or to unresolved adversity. And you see some pretty powerful numbers there. 56% of anxiety, 40% of recent depression, 67% of suicide attempts. In my way of thinking about that, it starts to suggest that successfully addressing those mental health sort of challenges maybe requires us to think about what we're doing to address adversity and trauma as a primary means of trying to solve some of those problems. And then if that was our baseline before 2020 and 2021, a lot of people are trying to figure out what did pandemic times do? And I just wanna clarify, we try to think of pandemic times as a little bit broader than just COVID. There are many dynamics at play over the past couple of years that in very interesting ways are contributing to the times that we live in. So COVID gets a lot of the attention, but it's really important to remember there are multiple other dynamics at play contributing to where we all are at. So let's talk a little bit about COVID. And again, this is probably reinforcing what you all know anecdotally, or maybe what you've done a little research on. Interesting articles you can find about the pandemic re referencing COVID. The language that strikes me here is long lasting emotional trauma on an unprecedented global scale. And a quote from one of the experts, the scale of this outbreak as a traumatic event is almost beyond comprehension. Some of you might have seen this. This was a group out of Ohio that tried to in April of 2020 get their arms more objectively around what's going on from a trauma and grief perspective. This was not empirically designed to be representative of the city or state they were in, nor designed to be a national snapshot, but it does give us helpful perspective that in April of 2020, 86% of their sur surveyed folks reported experiencing at least one or more trauma symptom. And 94% of that same group reported experiencing one or more grief symptom. That was April, 2020. So from a COVID point of view, it was a slightly different time than when we're in today. And so what we like to think about is three broad categories. When we start to look back at what we know about the effects, the effects of chronic and collective stress and trauma, talk a little bit again about that trauma mental health connection, talk about a concept we borrow from Dr. Bruce Perry called neurosociology, and talk a little bit about what many of us are concerned about and know that when these events occur, the vulnerable are more vulnerable. So again, if I show you this slide, just as a visual reminder, 
and we start to unpack some of the people who are trying to collect objective data, what was the baseline pre-pandemic times and what are we starting to see as a result of the last couple of years? Interesting data here from a parental point of view, assessing their mental health for their kids. Again, a time frame here of October, November, 2020. Some people really appreciate the metaphor thinking of the tsunami outcome of the 2021 sort of experience and that basically it's gonna produce a mental health tsunami. An interesting metaphor given there's been an earthquake in the ocean and yet that's not the only thing there is to be concerned about. And again, I've just listed a sampling here. Much of this is information most of you are all very familiar with. Sometimes though, it might be interesting to sort of package it in this way. And this is hot off the presses, as I'm sure all of you heard, the Surgeon General issuing a pretty rare statement talking about the youth mental health crisis in this country, probably a way of thinking about the culmination of some of the material we've been talking about. Talk briefly about neurosociology and introduce and remind some of you about a way that Dr. Perry characterizes this. So when our state, driven by degrees of difficult or overwhelming or traumatic stress, changes from calm or alert to alarm or fear, lots of state-related implications occur. Here's an example of looking at what happens to our intellectual capacity. The more overwhelmed and stressed we get, there are lots of other lines I could swap into that functional IQ sort of bar. We could talk about people's sense of time going from the future to sort of the immediate next couple minutes or hours. There are a myriad of implications on the individual level when stress becomes overwhelming or traumatic. There are also implications at the group level. So because we are human beings designed to read and respond to other human beings, one of the things we get concerned about is when there are collective and continuous experiences, you start to see some of these group related patterns. So groups that maybe at one point were very good at future problem solving, leveraging abstract sort of capability to address needs and issues, start to reflect a more concrete and superstitious or defensive sort of norm, or maybe start to develop more reactive and regressive sort of process as a means of sort of moving from that place of relative safety and calm to a place of fear. So I would just invite all of you to think about this frame as we start to look at global impact. Do we see evidence of communities and groups and cities and states that at one point were very strategic and creative and are now starting to reflect more concrete and practical work. And what does that potentially mean about the experiences we are having? Another one that I just wanna point out briefly is uh, the argument from Dr. Perry is that human beings are by nature designed to have the primary source of feeling good come from interactions with other people. So how do we navigate that in a pandemic where by definition, interaction with other people is limited or sparse or scarce? And what we point out here is that what we see when our primary instincts are thwarted, meaning the ability to connect with other people, 
is you can work your way around the top or bottom of this slide and predictably look where folks will go to feel good. So I didn't put this into the presentation, but there's some really interesting data on sales of alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And I think trauma and stress provide an interesting perspective or way to look at this. Another perspective from Dr. Perry, which is probably something most of you can say amen to, just a key outcome of prolonged stress is just sheer exhaustion. So counseling or advice that says expect more fatigue, expect people to be less capable of focus, expect more irritability, and wherever possible, be as gentle as we can be. And just quick comments on reinforcing what, again, many of you know already. Whatever degree of vulnerability someone might have, we know that generally, but not exclusively thinking, vulnerability sort of leads to more vulnerability in these events. From a trauma point of view, there's a good body of research that suggests any pre existing trauma, childhood trauma, adult trauma, secondary trauma creates a little more vulnerability for any current trauma. And many of you know the rates of adversity and trauma pre pandemic times. Just perspective on that from our sort of child and family well being program. And what does that mean for the helpers who are struggling with the sort of pandemic time outcomes as well and their ability to provide help for those they're charged with caring for? So one more comment on this. Uh, someone asked me just the other day, Tim, what is your biggest fear? So uh, at risk of ending on a down note, let me just share how I answered that question. I said, my biggest fear is this will turn into something of a vicious cycle. The vulnerable will continue to struggle. That will continue to put more demand on systems of care who are charged with helping and supporting those folks that may lead to more transition and sort of burnout and sort of challenge with systems of care, which will lead to staffing shortages, which will lead to sort of the quality of care becoming diminished, which will start to create a vicious cycle that I'm not sure how it's going to end. <laughs> I believe with all my heart that there are people who will stand and sort of buffer that outcome. But when I get carried away, that is one of the things that causes me to lose a little bit of sleep. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective. Let me just take these slides down and entertain any questions people might have. Please put your questions in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's funny, some of you know that uh, my significant other, Anne, um, and I are in this business together, and she has been very helpful in sort of when I do events like this to say, well, what are you going to tell people the good news is? Or how do we respond to this and move forward? And a couple of things come to mind for me. So thank you for your really good question, Barbara. Here is one way I would think about this. And again, please remember, I come to this with a trauma bias. Milwaukee County has built an infrastructure around knowledge and practice of trauma 
that goes back almost 14 years and beyond. There are many key players who are part of that infrastructure. And I think that's something we can leverage as one practical solution that maybe can make a difference if trauma indeed is connected to mental health in the way Dr. Sharfstein talks about. So let me say this in a different way. If Dr. Perry is right, that our history of connectedness is a better predictor of our health than our history of adversity, and we start to think of the most vulnerable and the number of interactions they have on a daily basis with friends, with neighbors, with professionals. And we work really hard to make sure that the quality of interaction remains high, remains compassionate, remains, dare I say, trauma-informed, even though we have less connections because of the pandemic, we can ensure that every arrow you see here can maximize the benefit to that individual. So they can stay as connected as we can possibly keep them. And that stands in stark contrast to individuals who present with some of these challenging problems and behaviors that are poorly understood or misunderstood, and thereby there are missed opportunities to have a quality, compassionate interaction. We know one of the ways to sort of have people's interactional maps look like this and not like that is to sort of teach as many people as we can teach in our way of thinking about things about how to be trauma informed, how to understand the role trauma might be playing in some of the challenge folks are facing. And again, making sure whether it's a 30 second or a two minute interaction, their interactional map looks like this. So Milwaukee County has a remarkable infrastructure of groups sort of designed to support and care for the most vulnerable who are pretty well versed at least in sort of the basic trauma-informed playbook. That's a silver lining to me. I have to believe that that can mean we can maximize relational interaction and we can mitigate some of the effects of what's going on. So I hope that wasn't too convoluted, Barbara. But that's one of the uh, other sort of silver linings that I can point to. I have a question that was private messaged. Um, do you know of any groups for care, um, for caregivers, um, therapists, and other types of workers who deal with caring for other people while they're also being affected themselves? Yeah, great question, Christine. So I presume we're talking about non-clinical groups. Um, and let me just sort of answer my own question in that way. So it's really important as a community we honor the potential impact of secondary trauma, which we construct as basically the absorption of somebody else's story that creates its own trauma-like response for the person who absorbed it. A lot of people can get great help from a traditional clinical perspective if they're struggling with that outcome. If the question is more about are there non-clinical support groups, et cetera, then I would say, great question. I, off the top of my head, can't think of any, but there might be others on the call who would know better than I. Did I catch the spirit of the question, Christine? Um, I believe so. If the person wants to um, speak freely, they can. I, I believe they private messaged me because they wanted me to ask the question. But yeah, I, I think a lot of um, the the feeling about this was that uh, we too are all in the same boat and yeah. it's pretty small and we're trying to care for others while we're also suffering. 
And so um, we may be more less vulnerable than others, but still vulnerable. And so we need shoring up ourselves. And how do we do that? I mean, one one option is getting our own clinical care and self care. But I don't know if there's a coordinated effort. Yeah, and maybe, Christine, it creates something of an opportunity. So let me say a little bit more about this concept of task shifting, which some of you have heard me talk about before. So in the public health world, there is a, a, an idea that there are different ways to solve problems. Most of us, and I just did it in response to your question, will connect problem solving to a clinical referral or intervention. In conversation, it goes something like this. You know, you seem to be struggling with some anxiety or depression. I know somebody who's really good at helping with that. Why don't you go check them out? And inevitably there's a clinical referral that somebody gets, right? In developing parts of the world, access to that clinical resource is either too expensive or not available. So what Dr. Vikram Patel and others talk about is this concept of, can we take what the clinical person knows? Can we translate and distill it for non-clinical people and empower them to sort of provide some degree of care and support? And if you look at some of Dr. Patel's work, the empirical outcomes the non-clinical people produce is sometimes akin or better than what the clinical folks produce. I think there is an opportunity here for us as a community to say, how do we empower everybody to be a better neighbor, to be a better friend? to be a better sort of co-parishioner, whatever body of sort of religion, if that is your thing you practice. And my belief is if we can empower and maybe even structurally fund a little bit of that, that can start to sort of chip away at some of the problem as well. We are not gonna have enough clinical people to solve this problem. Let me just say that right now. If you read the story in the paper last weekend, you know that even the regulatory bodies are struggling to keep up with the demand for clinical resource. That cannot be the sole solution to this problem. So peer specialist programs, which are pretty present in our community. Um, yeah, thank you, Martina. There are people who are ready to stand up and be part of this problem solving, solution generating. Honestly, if I can be a little provocative, they've historically been underappreciated and underfunded. And what we tend to do is direct all the funding towards those traditional sort of people to respond. Maybe this is an opportunity to change that. Maybe, because we're going to need a bigger boat. So yeah, if you haven't had a chance to sort of uh, uh, look at Martina's wisdom, amen. We're just about at time. Thank you so much for coming in at the end of the year and offering your words of wisdom and empirical research. Um, we uh, we thank you for this opportunity to hear um, about the new ways of thinking, and it's really a provocative thing. The only thing I, I ask of you is uh, maybe we could uh, you could put that reference um, Vikram Patel in oh, sure. to Barbara or something. We could disseminate that. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of ways. I'll he does a really powerful TED talk. I will send that link to Barbara. Thank you so much. Um, I will turn the meeting over to Barbara, I believe at this point. Thanks again. My pleasure. Great. Yeah, I just wanna add my thanks to, to those of Christine, Tim. Um, you've really given us some sustenance and, and food for thought about how we might move forward. And I'm really personally grateful for that as, 
well as on behalf of the task force. So I'm just moving back over to our agenda here and gonna go back to my gallery view. So um, one of the things that we are doing at this time, probably like a lot of you, um, it's the end of the year. 2021's been uh, a bumpy ride uh, and looking ahead to 2022. And we really, um, as a task force, want to ask for your ideas and your input uh, to help us with planning. We've done some initial planning as a steering committee on some of the programmatic topics um, that we're going to focus on in the next year. And you may have noticed on the agenda that we have plans already um, for the January meeting, which will focus on housing. And that has been such a strong priority over the years for the mental health task force, because if people don't have safe, affordable, accessible housing, you know, recovery is really in jeopardy. People can't maintain their mental health if they don't have a, a safe place to live where they, where they feel safe and can work on their recovery. So um, we encourage you to join us on January 11th. Uh, and February 18th, uh, February 8th rather, we are going to have um, the first of several forums that will focus on the intersection between mental health and the criminal justice system, also a topic that we focused on for a lot of years. Um, but beyond that, while we have a lot of ideas, um, we haven't nailed things down and that's where you come in. So I am just um, looking now for the link that I wanna share with you. We have a little mini survey that we want to invite you to complete. And I'm gonna put that into the chat. and. Uh, I'm hoping that folks will take the time. We have su such a great brain trust around the table with this task force. Uh, I've just put the survey out there and we'll also send out a follow-up uh, email for all of you to connect with us and to share your suggestions for speakers, for topics you would like us to address. And if you would like to, uh, if you have an idea or a program that you would like to bring to the task force in this next year. We would like to hear from you. It's gonna be a year with a, a lot of transitions with the county's role as a provider of inpatient mental health services coming to an end, uh, transitioning to a new emergency mental health center. And for all of this to move forward in a way that is a positive, for people in our community with mental health needs, you know, we all need to be a part of the solution and to get behind it. It's also gonna be an election year. So that's also um, something that we'll be keeping you informed on so that you know who the candidates are, what your voting rights are, and have an opportunity to make your voice heard and to support others uh, in the mental health community who may have barriers to voting and to exercising their rights to vote. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Please complete the survey. And um, we hope that you will be back in January for a really solid uh, session that's gonna focus on housing. So that's my pitch to you. I'm gonna turn it over now to our awesome co-chair, Mary Neubauer, to share a few uh, updates from the Mental Health Board. And if we have time, I have a few updates on some state policy issues as well that I think will be of interest to folks. So take it away, Mary. I just wanted to share something on housing before we move on. And that's that uh, the um, Section 8 housing for the city of Milwaukee, um, the, the is going, the uh, Section 8 housing list is gonna be open tomorrow at, 8, 8, at 9 a.m. Um, I don't have the information. I don't have the link. Yeah, Mary, we had shared that with the listserv. I can circulate it again. If oh, that... I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was on the no, list. No, no, that's okay. It was yep. a, at least a week ago, I think. Yep. So I just wanted to oh, mention, okay. yep, the, uh, the list. So for Section 8 housing for the city of Milwaukee will be open tomorrow 
um, at 9 a.m. And what it is, is it's just basic information, name, address, date of birth, it's six things. And you're filling the information out for pre-verification. And if you make it through the pre-verification, you then go into a lottery and then your name gets drawn from a lottery um, after there's a timeline on the form and it will tell you. And then that determines whether you get a section eight voucher for the city of Milwaukee. There's four different categories. So Barbara is gonna resend the form out um, and all the details are on there. So I just wanted to mention that uh, because I believe it's been since 2015 since the city list has been open. So um, as far as the mental health board goes, we had our last meeting for the year on Thursday of last week. Um, it was a very good meeting. Uh, we went through um, financial documents. Uh, we went through uh, basically, it was of reports. Um, went through the, the quality report for the last quality meeting, through the uh, finance, and basically, we had lost money on the inpatient hospital, and that's because uh, the number of patients is significantly reduced uh, because of COVID. And um, because, so that's the bottom line there. Uh, CCS, Comprehensive Community Services, is, is doing much better, is doing significantly well. I believe uh, we have about 1,800 people uh, including adults and children in CCS. So that's the most expansive services and community-based services. Um, the um, Granite Hills Hospital on the 8th of December received its certification from, I can't remember which agency, but they now can receive patients from the behavioral health division. So that opened the door and it also set the timeline for them then to set the clock to be certified in six months from the joint commission um, to fully open their doors. So that put that into place. Uh, we're on time and actually a tiny, we're on time to open the uh, Mental Health Emergency Center in May of 2022. Um, and the other thing I wanted to focus on is the Behavioral Health Division and Wraparound Wellness Clinic. We have a wellness clinic based in the hospital for youth that are in wraparound and on CCS. And um, that outpatient clinic is being redesigned and is gonna be relocated out in the community on 19th and North. And I um, can't remember the name. I was looking for the name of the building it's going to be in. Um, 1919 West North Avenue. So the building will be relocated out into the community and it's gonna be a DHS 35 clinic. And for those of you that it makes sense to uh, about being a DHS 35 clinic, it has to do with the type of services it can provide. And what I do know is that um, they will have a psycho, they will have psychotherapy there, but the main service is to provide uh, services by nurse practitioners and psychiatrists for youth and young adults that are in the wraparound and CCS program uh, because finding a prescriber is very, very difficult. And, uh, um, and actually Tracy orders on the line. And if Tracy wants to comment on this, what is the time frame now 
for a youth or young adult to find a psychiatrist out in the community, is it 18 months, two years? Um, yeah, it's, it's upside of a year for sure. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in this clinic, I think it's about six months. So, kid, so youth that will be in wraparound and CCS, it'll be about six months. Um, so that's actually positive news. Great. And um, if you want more information, uh, you can go to the mental health board website. I mean, to the it's now on the on the uh, Legistar website because that's where all the materials are. And look for this report, and you can get all of the fine details. And uh, the schedule is posted for the 2022 board meetings. And um, does anybody have any questions or would they like any additional information about the final board meeting or anything else about the mental health board? Okay. Thank you, Mary. If you can get uh, that link to me to the report, we'd love to share that with the listserv. It sounds like it's got a lot of good information. Yeah, it's got a lot of great information in it. So sure, we wanted, great, thank you so much. We wanted to pivot now just for a quick state legislative update because um, there are several bills of interest that we wanted you to have on the radar and hope as they move forward. Uh, that you may consider weighing in on them. So the first one has to do with expanding TAD, the Treatment Alternatives and Diversion Program. Uh, right now it's still um, an LRB, it doesn't have a bill number yet. Uh, and just for anyone who isn't familiar, TAD stands for Treatment Alternatives and Diversion Program. And it allows uh, people in the justice system who are nonviolent uh, offenders and currently it's people diagnosed with substance use disorder to get uh, provides funding for evidence-based programming instead of being incarcerated. So it's a really positive thing. And a lot of our agencies and the mental health task force have advocated for years for this to be expanded so that if someone's primary diagnosis is a mental health disorder, they would be eligible for the TAD program. And Unfortunately, there have been over the years some legislators who weren't on board with that and have blocked it. But there's a bipartisan bill that just came out and um, Representative Goyke, uh, who's of course a Milwaukee Democrat and Representative Tittle, who's a Republican and chairs the Assembly Mental Health Committee uh, brought this forward together. So that's a really good sign, you know, having um, Representative Tittle taking a lead on this is really positive. So I hope it's something that we will all rally around as it moves forward in the legislature. The deadline for co-sponsorship was on Friday the 10th. Um, so I'm expecting very soon that there should be a bill number. And when that comes out, we'll share that with you. And um, let's just hope that we can start the new year off with something positive and that at long last, this bill will move forward and be signed into law. There was a lot of additional money for TAD in the state budget, not as much as we wanted, but there was additional money and this would expand eligibility in a way that would be very po positive. So that's one proposal we wanted to share with you. Uh, another area is, you know, we've heard a variety of references today, I think to the workforce shortage that we are experiencing right now in the mental health field and in a number of healthcare areas. And I had shared with you an article that was in the journal Sentinel uh, within the past week or so that talked about some of the infrastructure problems that the state has because of very antiquated computer systems that are causing backups in terms of people who have done their due diligence and done their training and they wanna get the hours they need to be licensed and they can't even get that provisional licensure. So there's a bill that um, sounds very promising, um, AB 217, that would address provisional licensing. 
It was supposed to have a hearing this week and there was a lot of excitement about that, but it got delayed. But anyhow, it would allow, um, it would help the backlog of licensing applications by allowing them to go to work right away while they're waiting for their application to be processed and getting this provisional licensure. So once that hearing is scheduled or rescheduled, we'll get the word out to you right away and hope that you will um, consider weighing in. I think it could be really helpful to have broad support for the mental health community. And at a time when there's such a shortage of providers, this could be one way that we can make a difference. And uh, finally, I wanted to mention as well, a uh, bill that um, already had a hearing, but I thought would be of concern to some of you. This is a bill that my agency, Disability Rights Wisconsin, had take a position on uh, and opposed. And it is a bill that would consider incarceration in and of itself as grounds for parental rights termination. Uh, and we were very concerned about that. Certainly, you know, there, there are, we want children to be protected and there are a lot of protections in current law and to terminate someone's parental rights simply because they're incarcerated, um, we thought was very troubling. And particularly looking at the racial disparities in our state and who is incar incarcerated. And there's such a high percentage of individuals from Milwaukee County and men of color who are incarcerated, women as well. So we thought that was very troubling. So that bill, um, SB 595 AB 627 uh, did have a hearing uh, within the past week and we'll see what happens and, and how it moves forward. But wanted you to be aware of that as well. So um, a lot still moving forward on the legislative front too in terms of voting rights. And um, that's an area also where we continue to be concerned so um, stay tuned for more information on that front. 2022 is a year with a lot of elections, including uh, we anticipate an election for the mayor of Milwaukee, although we don't quite know when uh, that will take place. And I have had some initial discussions with uh, community advocates and their policy institute about collaborating on a candidate forum. And um, that could potentially be a really good opportunity to hear where the candidates stand on a lot of issues that are important to us as a task force. So we'll keep you posted on that. One of the challenges is we don't yet know when the pr primary will be for the mayoral candidates because uh, the Senate has not yet acted on Mayor Barrett's appointment as ambassador to Luxembourg. Depending on when he steps down, will determine when that primary <laughs> takes place. So uh, kind of a messy situation. So any questions about legislative updates or anyone around the table who might wanna add anything? Uh, Reverend Elwinger, I know you've been doing so much advocacy around the mental health treatment court. Are there any updates that you might wanna share with the task force at this time to put you on the spot? Well, uh, nothing concrete yet. Uh, we have the, the three avenues that we continue to pursue uh, to make a mental health treatment court in Milwaukee County a reality in 2022. One of them is the bill that you mentioned earlier uh, that would expand TAD funding to include mental health treatment courts. That's uh, very important. A, a second uh, avenue that we are uh, pursuing is getting some ARPA funding uh, for two years for the $150,000 a year that's needed to establish a uh, full-scale mental health treatment court and uh, can't get uh, any commitments on that. The county uh, ARP, ARPA board has uh, <clears throat> uh, made its first determination on uh, allocating funds, but there's still some funds left in that first year of funding. And so we're gonna uh, push on that. Uh, 
And of course, the third possibility is simply uh, finding uh, some philanthropic sources because there are uh, uh, foundations out there that are really concerned about mental health in this day and time, and especially COVID-19. So uh, if anyone on the, around this big table here has any thoughts about how we can push forward on any of those three avenues, let us know. As soon as that, uh, that uh, ex TAD expansion bill uh, becomes a uh, bill and there's a hearing, we will definitely uh, be there, Micah, uh, to pursue that. Well, thank you so much. With the ARPA funding, if you think it would be helpful to have other letters of support go into the um, task force or committee that the county has convened, you know, please reach out to me because we could take that to the Mental Health Task Force Steering Committee. And I, I suspect that there would be strong support for that given that this is something the task force has supported over the years. Uh, that's a very good offer. I would suggest that uh, it, certainly any endorsements would be welcomed. And I think that uh, communication should go to County Executive Crowley and to Marcelia Nicholson, chair of the uh, board of the county, uh, because both of them have uh, real influence on the ARPA committee. Yeah, well, that's helpful. If you have any testimony that you've used that you would be willing to share um, so that we align with your recommendations, um, that would be great. Send it our way. I will do that. Thank you. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much for that, that very substantive update. That was great. And I'll turn it back over to Mary and Christine. I have one thing I can share about peer specialist. I sit on the um, certified peer specialist advisory advisory council for the state. And um, as it stands today, if you are submitting for your recertification and you don't have a date stamped and your funding in the day of your certification, um, your certification expires. And we're at the on the council or on the advisory committee where the state proposed at our meeting last Friday that we look at um, some language uh, to ease up on that, that there would be some stipulations around some grace periods of days, um, like a 30 day grace period and a, a, a graduated grace period. So I just wanted to let you know if you know any peer specialists to, or if there's any peer specialists on the line to know that we're looking at a grace period around the recertification process. So that was the other thing uh, that I can add in. Christine? Just, uh, thanks again, everyone, for um, showing up for our wonderful guest speakers today, and thank you to our guest speakers. And um, I know this was mentioned already, but please keep January 11th. And I, I, sorry, Mary, I think it was January 27th for the uh, next board, uh, Milwaukee County Board meeting. Yes, the 27th. Public comment. That's yes. all. Yes. All right. Well. Enjoy your holidays. If you have holidays coming up to celebrate, have a happy new year and we will see you in February. Travel safe. Bye-bye. Please complete the survey. Thanks, Mary. Take care.